me, I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I've got one friend laying across from me. I did not choose him. He did not choose me. We've got no chance of recovery, sharing hospital, joy and misery. Those are some lines by the indie rock band Cold War Kids, lines I first heard, first heard about from, of all people, my former PhD supervisor, the venerable Professor Stephen Connor here at Cambridge. Don't say I'm not cool. Steve writes about how much those lines move him at the end of a strange little article which he put up on his personal website in 2017. It's the closest thing I think that he, a happy atheist, has ever written to a sermon. The article's a meditation on hospitals and his attachment to them, inspired by visiting a dying friend. The thing that Steve says he values about hospitals in the article is precisely their impersonality. Hospitals are, in his words, full of people who are more interested in the idea of your illness than its embodiment in you, particularly. A hospital is a place where we rely for our security, for our very survival, on the fact that other people have faced ailments and symptoms that are like ours. The fact that we're being treated by people who can turn to evidence gathered from hundreds of other nameless sick people for guidance. Everything that we hold on to that makes us individuals, that we shore up as signs of our own special value, is revealed as secondary to that which makes me a bit like everyone else. Which makes the principle that underpins our own National Health Service, of which we mark the 72nd birthday today, all the more fitting. The principle that care should be provided equally and freely at the point of use to all who require it. Because the way I individualise myself is precisely by finding my security among a particular set of other people, whether that's determined by wealth or age or the whims of my own personal taste. And illness sweeps all that aside. I've got one friend laying across from me. I did not choose him. He did not choose me. We can map those lines, I think, onto the parable at the end of our gospel reading today. Two people lying across from each other, suffering in their separate beds from a similar injury. An injury that prevents each of them from being the perfect disciple that God created them to be. One common sense reading of this passage might take the sequence that Jesus presents here at something like face value. You just need to do the work of looking carefully at yourself, recognising your own faults, and then shalt thou see clearly. You'll be qualified to do the work of correcting others, perhaps with an ongoing degree of modesty. This reading assumes that we're individuals first and foremost, with our own personal foibles and neuroses, and it's our confident recognition of those which allows us to extrapolate, to begin working on collective problems together from that starting point, as we edge forward in working out what it is to be Christ-like. But if everyone's being encouraged to do that, if everyone accepts that they have the beam rather than the moat in their eye, it begs the question of who will move first. And if there is no leader here, Surely we'll just remain either the blind leading the blind or refusing even to try, either perpetually falling back into the ditch or staying stuck within it. I've got one friend lying across from me. I did not choose him. He did not choose me. These lines move me, um, as they probably did not move Steve, the happy atheist, because they remind me of another memorable phrase which rang in my ears as I discerned a call to a priestly ministry. And that's the line from John 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. I might not have chosen the people in whose company I find myself, but Christ chose the company of all of us. He is the master with whom no disciple yet shares that same level of perfection. At the end of the day, there's no such thing as self-help. I can only conceive of that nice reciprocal community of individual subjects being merciful and forgiving and non-judgmental towards each other because the Father was merciful first in the offering of his Son. Everything that I can judge about a person pales into insignificance 
before the fact that the Father himself judged them worthy to be called into existence and to be redeemed by sending his Son to share that existence. The utter scandal of the Christian faith, the scandal that I'll freely admit I'm still usually a bit too willful to shut up and accept, is that yes, that person over there is just as beloved a servant and disciple of Christ as me. Yes, even as they believe that about him. Yes, even as they do that to worship him. I persevere that knowing all of those people are on the same journey in coming to terms with me, in ways that it's not my place to spell out as such and try to help them with. It's my own failure to see other people as signs of Christ, to choose to be with them as freely as Christ did, that stops me from being a sign of Christ to others. But that's a failure that's beyond my own capacity to heal, because it's bound up in the failures of my neighbour. We've got no chance of recovery each by ourselves, But we've also got no such chance if we just try earnestly to work together without common reference to the Christ that neither of us have a monopoly on. In the church, as in a hospital, our individuality is revealed as a fragile cover, a fragile cover story for a deeper, deeply embarrassing collectivity. In the church, the grounds on which we recognise that collectivity isn't the gathered history of afflictions that threaten human bodies, backgrounds is the incarnate person of Christ. But maybe those grounds aren't, in a sense, all that different. For in order to redeem all of us, by identifying with all of us, to mark us all as capable of bearing his fruit, Jesus had to bear the consequence of what human beings do to each other without his intervention. On the, on the cross, Jesus himself had to live through what happens and what continues to happen when we can't quite treat others as if they were fellow children of God. God is present not only as the universal healer who breaks down every division between us. He is also there crying out in the pain that each of us has to suffer individually because of our sustained inevitable obsession with our own wants and needs or the wants and needs of those who we think are most like us. St Paul presents something like this in this morning's epistle. You can hear him there initially humouring the church in Rome. Glory shall be revealed in them as the sons of God, freeing creation from its futility. But having the first fruits of Christ's spirit, as they do, doesn't entitle them to hover over a groaning, labouring creation ready to heal it. No, those first fruits mean that they identify more deeply with that groaning expectation. Because, as this passage from Romans goes on to spell out, the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It is only by crying out in common pain and listening to the pains of others that our infirmities are healed. In his introduction to some prayers that the church commissioned this week to commemorate the NHS anniversary, the Bishop of Exeter um, makes little reference to the immense support that the, the NHS has needed and received during lockdown, particularly as shown by the Thursday clap for carers. Thanksgiving, the Bishop says, binds communities together, turning I into we. It's easy to be enamoured to the idea of a church as well as of a health service that has the power to successfully complete that binding, to recognise that we really are all in this together, confident that we really do believe that all lives matter, no longer groaning wounded individuals in our silos, but the glorious sons of God. But precisely because we're the church on earth, we're not there yet. Just before this passage from Luke in today's Gospel reading, Jesus says that we are called to love our enemies, and I think we should draw attention to the fact that he doesn't say our enemies will not cease to exist, that love will continue across that enmity. One of the perverse strengths of the NHS over the course of its history is that its radically egalitarian principles have shone a light on those people whose needs it has failed to meet on those terms, on those it has failed to see in quite, the, in, in quite that position of equality whether that's people facing under-resourced mental health crises, those seeking gender transition, 
most strikingly during the present crisis, its own black and minority ethnicity members of staff. And as much as I cling to the Church of England as a church that can represent the whole nation standing together, the truth is that we're still often unwilling to look fiercely at our wounds and divisions and exclusions along those lines I've just mentioned and along an array of others. We struggle to see in those wounds the place where Christ stands revealed, in the misery of our common sins, as well as in our joy at their future reconciliation. One of the stories that kept my faith going during the lockdown was of what was happening at the Cathedral of St John the Divine in New York, which was turned into a makeshift emergency hospital while public worship was suspended. Perhaps that reveals something about what the church has been all along and what it will stand reveal as once all our hang-ups and fantasies about it are stripped away. As we ourselves now turn to make intercession in the spirit and to confess our sins together, trusting that we can do so in the words of our prayer book right, as a corporate we, how will we continue to carry that different image of Christ's spirit groaning in the differences between us? How could we hold those differences that remain unhealed were it not for his grace? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.